Hi, I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Nick Vasquez writes, I read that the Swiss Army rapidly increased the size of its standing army from 38,000 in November 1916 to over 100,000 in the winter of 1617 because of concerns of a proposed French invasion plan called Plan H. Ooh, Plan H. I can't find any more information on Plan H. I was wondering if you guys could go into more detail about it. I love the names of plans. They're always good, right? Okay, um, Switzerland, right. Uh, Switzerland, they mobilized their army in August 1914. But there were ups and downs over the years in terms of men seeing active service depending on the current threat of an invasion. For example, 200,547 men were mobilized right after the outbreak of the war. But when it became clear that both Germany and France would respect Swiss neutrality, more and more of them were, they were sent home. Late 1916 did indeed bring renewed concerns about an invasion, though from Germany and not from France. As a reaction, the Swiss general staff consulted with French military leaders who created Army Group H, uh, Helvetia, under Ferdinand Foch, which was supposed to aid Switzerland in the event of a German invasion. But that winter passed without any such attack. And over the following years, it became increasingly clear that all of the warring nations profited from a neutral Switzerland that could serve as a forum for diplomats or spies. By September 1918, Swiss armed forces guarding the Swiss borders had been reduced to 20,124 men. Uh, James Fox writes, sometime, hey, you know, you know Michael J. Fox? You know what's funny is you think, you know, he's a whole actor's name, Michael J. Fox, but if you want to freak people out, if you're talking about a Michael J. Fox movie, say, hey, last night I saw that Mike Fox movie. And they'll go, what? Yeah, Mike Fox, you know, you know that actor did all those movies in the 80s? And they'll say, Michael J. Fox? And you'll say, yeah, Mike Fox. Isn't it fun to think of him as Mike Fox? I hope Mike Fox watches my show. If he does, somebody um, show this to Mike Fox. James, maybe he's your dad or something. I hope so. Okay, anyway, sometime between 1915 and 1916, my great-grandfather was presented with a white feather, ooh, denoting him as a coward, which made him feel it ne necessary to join the British Army to prove otherwise. Was this white feather smear campaign supported by the government? Did other countries in the Great War have a white feather campaign? Did attitudes towards people, uh, mostly women from what I understand, change or become hostile towards the end of the war? Well, the white feather campaign was not officially supported by the British government, but it was brought to life by uh, Admiral Charles Cooper Penrose Fitzgerald as a private effort. It gained momentum through press coverage and the endorsement of prominent women from both the suffragette and anti-suffragette camps. Um, over the following years, the campaign it did start to cause problems for the government when more and more public servants or workers in essential industries came under pressure to enlist and leave those industries to go to war. As a response, uh, Home Secretary uh, Reginald McKenna issued badges reading King and Country to those who performed tasks that were essential to the war effort. It seems like the campaign still enjoyed a certain degree of support among the civilian population, while it was unpopular among soldiers since they would sometimes be presented with white feathers while they were home on leave or after having been honorably discharged. Since Britain introduced compulsory service conscription of all men aged 18 to 41 in January 1916, I suspect that the feather campaign lost some of its momentum. Nevertheless, there are several reported instances of men re still receiving feathers in mid or late 1916. Okay, this also sheds a bit of light on the question whether similar campaigns occurred in other countries during the war. Um, since all continental European powers relied on conscription, uh, no such campaigns were really necessary to shame the men into volunteering. The White Feather Campaign did, however, spread to the British dominions like Canada and Australia. Michael Jerome de Guzman asks, um, 
I heard there was a German monoplane design during the First World War. This was the Junkers J1 and Junkers D1 models, and I have read that they were being experimented on during the war. My question is, why didn't Germany continue the plane's development? Well, as for the Junkers J series, it turned out that airplanes made out of steel were simply not able to meet military requirements at the time. Hugo Junkers wrote in the summer of 1916, as a result of the first and second aircraft, one would ascertain that the aerodynamic efficiency was very good. We thought we were over the hill. This, unfortunately, was not the case. We had to start again from the very beginning. The reason was that in spite of the favorable horizontal speed, the aircraft could not meet the military climb specifications. The Junkers D-1 was made out of lighter metal and performed relatively well as a fighter, but it came too late in the war to be produced in significant numbers. Um, the resource-intensive all-metal design only around, allowed for around 30 machines to be manufactured, and only 12 of those were ever delivered to the troops. Speaking of Ferdinand Foch, we did a bio special about him, and you can check it out right there. And if you'd like to wear Ferdinand Foch on your chest or see him on your wall each day, you can check out our official merchandise store below.